So it is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Donald Berwick. Dr. Berwick is President Emeritus and Senior Fellow at the Institute of Healthcare Improvement and former administer, administrator of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. A pediatrician by background, Dr. Berwick has served on the faculty of the Harvard Medical School and Harvard School of Public Health and on the staffs of Boston's Children's Hospital, Massachusetts General Hospital, and the Brigham and Women's Hospital. He's also served as Vice Chair of the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force and Chair of the National Advisory Council of the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. Recognized as a leading authority on healthcare quality and improvement, Dr. Berwick has received numerous awards for his contributions. One in particular in 2005, he was appointed Honorary Knight Commander of the British Empire. That was bestowed on him by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Dr. Berwick is an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine and currently serves as lecturer in the Department of Healthcare Policy at Harvard Medical School. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Berwick to Dartmouth. Um, thank you uh, so much, Dean Compton, uh, Dr. Weinstein, uh, Provost Dever, uh, Trustee Ellsberg, uh, honored graduates, uh, friends, family, uh, all. Um, congratulations first to you. You've really, uh, you've earned a day of celebration, even why you'll uh, now face your, your next mountains to climb. Uh, I want to say first how uh, delighted I am to be with you. My, my debt to uh, Dartmouth, and my, the depth of my connections here are, are inestimable. This has been a, a center for some of the most, most uh, pathfinding and courageous research on health systems of my, of my lifetime. Uh, the legacy here and the example is here of uh, Jack Weinberg and Elliot Fisher and Mike Zubkoff, uh, Steve Plume, uh, Jim Weinstein, Al Mully, just to name a few of my close and longstanding colleagues. Jack Weinberg especially whom I hope you've had a chance to meet in your time here. Um, imagine what life was like for him uh, 40 years ago as Jack, uh, very unwelcome, uh, began to unravel the threads of variation in practice uh, in healthcare. I think probably the most polite reception he got from his mainstream clinical colleagues was uh, something like buzz off. Uh, Jack, as you know, he showed rates of uh, variation uh, in tonsillectomy, hysterectomy, prostatectomy, and, and many more things that, uh, that were 300 or 400 or 500 percent from community to community. Uh, he discovered nonsense, pure nonsense, uh, in an enterprise that sanctimoniously had laid a claim to science as its foundation. And in some very deep sense, Jack uh, began here the modern quality movement in which I have spent my entire career. I have no closer a soulmate or personal hero than Elliot Fisher who carries on that tradition here of strong system science linked to moral clarity. And that's my theme this morning, moral clarity. Uh, a bit high-minded, but excuse me, I'm graduation speaker. Um, <laughs> I want to say first, I don't have any illusions at all that you're going to remember what I say. I, I don't even remember who my graduation speaker was from medical school, and I have no idea what he or she, in my time it would have been he actually, uh, said. Uh, but these are not usual times, and um, maybe, just maybe, you are worried enough to be looking for some advice right now. I sure am. Um, on January 27th, uh, 1838, uh, Abraham Lincoln was 28 years old and he gave one of his first major speeches. He spoke at the Young Man's Lyceum in Springfield, uh, Illinois. That was in the wake of episodes of mob violence, including the death by burning of a black man in St. Louis, which activated uh, Lincoln's remarks. In part, here is what he said. Lincoln said, uh, 
shall we expect some transatlantic military giant to step the ocean and kill us at one blow? Never. All the armies of Europe, uh, Asia, and Africa combined, he said, could not by force take a drink from the Ohio or make a track on the Blue Ridge in a trial of a thousand years. At what point then, he asked, is approach of danger to be expected? If it ever reach us, he said, it must spring up amongst us. It cannot come from abroad. If destruction be our lot, we must ourselves be its author and finisher. As a nation of free men, Lincoln said, we must live through all time or die by suicide. I am worried today about death by suicide for so much of what we hold dear, what we must hold dear. And uh, this is a day of celebration. Be happy, but I'm also moved to call to your attention a dark cloud and to your duty as uh, citizens and as professionals to take a stand. In my opinion, I'm not sure of this, but I think that you will be the generation of healthcare professionals who are the most challenged by ethical choices in perhaps a century. You didn't ask for that burden, I know it, but it is yours. History has made it yours. And I'm gonna explore those choices that face you in three levels. Um, personal choices, organizational choices, and societal choices, and you are going to face choices in each of those levels. In thinking about this uh, talk and, and that framework, I, I recalled an, uh, an old poem by Carl Sandburg um, that I think I read in high school, you probably did too. The, phone, the, the, the poem is called Fog, it's short. Uh, Sandburg wrote, the fog comes in on little cat feet. It sits looking over harbor and city on silent haunches and then moves on. The fog comes in on little cat feet, he wrote. You, you may think that ethical choices, the moral choices I'm talking about, come uh, with a brass band, you know, Darcy declaring loyalty at the guillotine or Joan of Arc at the stake or Martin Luther King or John Lewis on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Uh, that, that moments of fame and drama frame all this. You know, here I am, uh, ethics, forget that. For you and for me, for most people, uh, the choices that matter, they come in unannounced on, on little cat's feet. They are silent on arrival and they're gone almost before you notice. I'll tell you one for me. I am not proud of this story, but it's a good case. Uh, and I've never told it before. Uh, this was 45 years ago. I was about to graduate from medical school. I was in your seat. And I was interviewing for the match, the residency match. I wanted to stay in Boston. My first choices were the Brigham Hospital and Mass General in medicine. This was the night before my Brigham Hospital interview. I was on duty overnight as a pre-intern at uh, Mass General at that time. And I was scared out of my mind about the interview the next day at the place I wanted to be. And... Uh, I said to my supervising junior resident, uh, I'm really scared. I have my Brigham interview tomorrow, and I'm, I'm nervous. He said, you should be, he said quite helpfully. <laughs> he said, they are brutal. He said, I still remember the question they opened with. He said, it was impossible. I said, tell me more. He said, well, <laughs> he said, they told me a story uh, from the very first days of hemodialysis, uh, which the Brigham Hospital had pioneered. And they said that a patient on dialysis, one of the first, had become confused and then delirious. And so they called the medical resident to come and see him. And the resident showed up, he examined the guy, and he noticed, among other things, nystagmus, eye movements. And then they said the resident immediately made the correct diagnosis, uh, began the correct treatment, and arguably he saved the man's life. And the question was, what was the diagnosis? I said, I have no idea. <laughs> I would, was even more scared, thanks to my re helpful resident. <laughs> and the resident said, I didn't have any idea either. He said, later on, weeks later, someone told me the answer. The man had Wernicke's encephalopathy. He was acutely thiamine deficient. Uh, dialysis, which was brand new, was removing water-soluble vitamins from the body, uh, which no one had anticipated. And uh, 
at the time, and so uh, no one realized that di dialysis could cause acute vi uh, vitamin deficiency for water-soluble vitamins. The resident figured it out, gave him thiamine, and rescued the patient. I said, oh, shoot. Actually, I didn't say, oh, shoot. You can guess what I said. <laughs> I said, I'm screwed. Um, so the next day, the Inter Brigham interview came. Uh, it was a marathon, I, I, I remember. I think there were seven three-person panels. Each panel peppered the candidate. Some of you are nodding. I guess you are still there. <laughs> uh, the, the, the panel peppered the candidate with, for five or ten minutes with questions. And I was halfway through the panels, panel number four or something, when I walked in the room, and I instantly knew that was the panel. It was the chief of medicine, the head of the residency program, and a world-famous cardiologist. And these guys up on a dais glared down at me, and they paused. I gulped. And then the chief of medicine began. He said, Mr. Berwick, some years ago, during the first days of dialysis here, <laughs> the patient became disoriented and dizzy. The resident was called. He noticed nystagmus, and he made the correct diagnosis. On little cat's feet. Uh, to this day, I remember the feeling. Uh, the impulse to burst out laughing, uh, <laughs> sweat kind of covering my body. I had a choice, a choice. It came unbidden, unannounced. This test was not to be of my knowledge or my promise as a doctor. It was to be of my character. And that test, I failed. I told you I'm not proud of this story, uh, but I will tell you with cold-blooded precision, I furrowed my brow and I faked it. I pretended that I was reasoning my way to the right answer, even though without any forewarning, I could not possibly have reached that answer on my own any more than I can get a 10 on an Olympic gymnastic floor exercise. <laughs> but it didn't matter. I could see it in their eyes. They wanted me. Uh, the question stopped, and this panel spent the, next, the rest of the interview telling me how wonderful the place the Brigham was for training. A day or two later, I couldn't resist telling that story to a, a, an adult friend of mine, a mentor. A uh, funny story, I thought, but his reaction woke me up. He didn't laugh. Uh, he didn't miss a beat. He said, Don, I'd be less than honest if I didn't tell you that I'm a bit disappointed in you. And I was, too, I, I realized. Uh, that evening, I withdrew my application for Brigham residency. Uh, but that has never, not even to this day, felt like... Uh, absolution for me. A choice had come on little cat's feet, and I didn't see it at the time for what it was. You will be there too. I guarantee that with no uncertainty at all. It, this is ethics at its uh, simplest, its purest, uh, its most elemental form. To, it, it is to tell the truth or not, when not is easier, perhaps in your short-term self-interest. Um, I say perhaps because when I think back uh, to that moment of choice, which I have done many times in my life, I can't help wonder what would have been the consequence of honesty. If I said, sirs, uh, I would have said to the panel, oh, this is an incredible coincidence but, well, coincidence, but last night I asked my resident about his interview here last year, and he told me the same story and the correct answer, and I want to assure you that I would not by any stretch of the imagination have arrived at the correct answer. What would have happened then, um, I asked myself. I won't ever know. You're going to have the same choice. I, I don't know if it will come tomorrow or next week or next year. I can't say, but it will come, and it will come once. It will come again and again and again, always on cat's feet, uh, suddenly, too suddenly for you to wing it, I promise you. And so don't wing it. Get prepared. Decide now. I wish I had, uh, the truth or not, uh, commit now. The second form of choice at a different level is going to come also in, it'll come in equal silence, and I want to take a moment to get you ready for that one too. This has to do with your self-image as a doctor. Baldly, you're going to have to choose whether you are a hero or a citizen. Uh, your white coat, your stethoscope, your prescription rights, these are going to tempt you repeatedly into hero mode. You, you do have the power to look 
You have the power to act like you know what to do, even when you do not know what to do. You have the power to assert prerogatives that are denied to others, even to other health professionals. You, you have the right to say, my schedule, my OR time, my air time, my excellence. I talk, you don't. Don't fall for it. It may not sound like an ethics question, but it is an ethics question. And here's the deal. Healthcare is an exercise in interdependency. It is not an exercise in personal heroism. You, you simply cannot possibly do the right job alone. Um, and that produces a clash. The clash can flash into warfare, and it does. It's, it's warfare between the time-honored romantic image of the great physician as, as a priest or, or a field marshal and the greater need for teamwork and uh, generosity, deference to others. In other words, don't ask what you do. Ask what you are part of. Uh, ask who depends on me and how am I doing in their eyes. Um, you would incorporate into your daily practice, daily, the following question to be asked of your coworkers and your managers and your patients and your families of everyone. You ask them, is there anything I could have done differently last week that would have made your work easier? And then you listen to the answer and you change what you do. If this were 1972, 45 years ago, and I were given a graduation talk on ethics, uh, I would stop now, which you probably want me to do. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's what ethics meant in my day in your seats. Uh, personal ethics for sure, and maybe this idea of teamwork and interdependency as, as, as the pinnacle of duty, uh, and those choices about how to act. But times have changed and I'm not gonna stop, because uh, I'll, I'll be brief, but I want you to know that I think the stakes are up, and that's what makes you special now. In my day, I held unquestioned that the organizations that I worked in and worked for were at the bottom ethical that our healthcare institutions usually, if not always, put the interests of those they serve ahead of their own. I actually don't know if that was true then. I didn't know how to ask, but it is not now true. At least it cannot be taken for granted. Not when the interests of the people to be served are those of our communities and of society as a whole. It's not a choice I had to face. But the symptoms of organizational gluttony are rampant today, and the damage is severe. The drugs your patients depend on are experiencing price increases that cannot withstand the scrutiny of public interest or moral compass. Uh, new biologics of uh, unquestionable value are being priced at levels that are not just like extortion, they are extortion. They're holding the interests of patients and, and their lives hostage. Old, uh, invaluable, simple preparations that I depended on insulin, epinephrine, 17-hydroxyprogesterone, colchicine, and more, they are being captured or patented under legal loopholes and then priced tenfold or thirtyfold or a hundredfold over their long prior customary levels. Hospitals uh, playing the games afforded by an opaque and fragmented payment system and by the concentration of market share to monopoly or near monopoly levels, which allow them too to escalate prices and, and, and costs nearly at will. They are confiscating resources from other very badly needed in enterprises, both inside health, especially prevention, and outside, like, like schools and jobs and housing. And this unfairness, this self-interest, this defense of local stakes at the expense of our fragile communities and disadvantaged populations, it goes way, way beyond healthcare itself. So I claim, does your ethical duty, I think. Uh, let me give you two examples. You, you came to your calling as healers, and now as healers, you cannot in honesty, turn your faces away from what is truly causing suffering. Not if you're to heal. In my view, just editorially, the biggest travesty in current American social policy is not the failure to fund healthcare 
properly or, or the pricing games of healthcare companies. It is our criminal justice system. Incarcerating and, and stealing the spirit and hope of a larger population of a larger proportion of our population than any other developed nation on earth except possibly Russia. The harm is inestimable. And if taking the life years and the self respect of millions and millions of American youth, people of color by a ratio of eight to one, leaving them without choice, without freedom, without the hope of growth, is not a health problem, then you tell me in the name of everything that is good what is a health problem. And the harm done to our planet by inattention, inattention to and denial of the facts of science itself, it's grievous harm. If poisoning the air and, and desiccating the land and drying up the rivers and drowning our cities, our own cities and those of the poorest people on earth and creating a tsunami of displaced people greater than the world has ever known is not a health problem, then you tell me what is. Tell me that, that leaving refugees at our gates unwanted or children unfed or, or families unhoused or basic medical care uncovered, not guaranteed, or relying on conflict rather than compassion, if, you th if that is not a health problem, you tell me. War is a health problem. Ignorance is, hopelessness is, blaming the blameless is. And what does it have to do with you? Well, that, like honesty, is your choice. Um, I have an opinion, though, and I'm going to have to cloud up your very bright and well-earned day with that opinion. If we be healers, then the time has ended when the tasks that we shoulder stop at the door of an office or the threshold of an operating room or the front gate of a hospital. We must engage in the rescue of a society and of a political context that has forgotten to heal. That has become our job to your job. Professional silence in the face of social injustice is wrong. And Few things chill me more than to see the great institutions of our healthcare enterprise, hospitals, uh, groups, scientific bodies, our guilds, assume that the seat of bystander is available. That seat is gone. To try to avoid the uh, political fray through dignified silence is impossible because silence is now political. Engage or you assist the harm, and there is no third choice. Uh, this is a time of grave risk. We must either live for all time as a compassionate, uh, honest, equal, just society, a healed society, or die by suicide. And you have no way, I am sorry, to escape your part in that choice. I am so sorry. I wish it were simpler for you. Um, I told you once on a small matter, a personal matter, I chose wrong uh, to my lifelong regret. I did not hear the choice come in on little cat's feet, the choice. Now, it's your turn. You uh, listen for the cat. It's here. Choose. Thanks.